build in enough time and also related to that, build in enough budget, whether you're paying people in house, you're bringing in outsiders to do help, help you with your creativity and, and putting out your content. If you don't pay, if, if you don't have enough budget in there, if everyone is feeling this like really tight pinch all the time of like, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough budget and the deadlines are creeping up and we got to put out more content. You're going to find your team actually just going, Hey, uh, that, that firm over there, just make it look like them, but use our colors. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> You're listening to the Remarka Brand Podcast, where authentic brands win. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Remarka Brand Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Jones, with Sam Pagel. Thanks for being here again, Sam. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. It's like you got a lot of choice, though. You have to show yeah. up. Yeah, I, do. I made the hard choice, and I'm I'm here. So. <laughs> I appreciate it. Anyway, for everybody that's uh, tuning in, maybe you caught last episode. We talked all about how to make your content, how to make your marketing interesting. Uh, we covered all sorts of stuff. We covered um, things like how to like have a point of view, how to have a personality in order to infuse your marketing with some interesting uh, aspects of your culture from your firm. Uh, we talked about even mascots, uh, how to tell us a great story. We talked about some of the storytelling principles and how that helps to make your content and your marketing more interesting. Uh, thinking about your audience's point of view. And then we talked about all sorts of different like medias and channels that you need to be considering that will help to inform and, and really make your content more interesting. Uh, I think particularly we talked about events, but I don't think we even got a chance to talk about video and audio at all, which is hilarious. No. Um, that we didn't get to that. We had so much more we wanted to unpack, and that's why we're doing a part two today of how to make your marketing interesting. So uh, before we do that, before we get into that and unpack some more ways you can do that, Sam, have you got to name 10 things for us? I do. Mike, we're going to name 10 marketing tools that are going to come back from the grave. Ooh, I like this. How about you start us off? Uh, well, the ever classic carrier pigeons. Got to bring yep. them back. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. So zombie carrier pigeons is going to be, that's going to be yep. fun. Z zombie carrier pigeons. They eat each yeah, other. Because they're back from the their dead. their brains out. They're back from the dead. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to say flash. Mm. That was a fun. Flash animation. That flash was a fun websites. time, wasn't it? It was a fun time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you say so, <laughs> I remember having to do a whole website in flash and, uh, being like, oh, yeah. this is ridiculous. Why, why are we doing this? Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, that's two. Okay. I guess it's my turn. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, the obelisk, you know, oh, nice. that was a big marketing tool back in the day. Kind of like prove you're, you're the big man, yep. you're the big shot. And, uh, I think it's coming back. I think uh, brands should really be investing in obelisks. That's a great idea, Mike. Yep. I'm going to go with, you know, I wasn't there, so I can't confirm if this was a thing uh, a thousand years ago, but um, the uh, sailboat sail marketing. So like you would put your logo on somebody else's <laughs> sailboat. Um, sometimes maybe that's a pirate ship. Sometimes that's maybe uh -huh. like the British Navy, but kind of that, you know, guerrilla marketing out on the seas, out on the seven yeah. seas. I think I like that. Uh, I have found that there's this universal symbol for marketing that everyone uses. It's a megaphone, which mm. I don't think anyone has ever actually used in their marketing activities. So I think it's time. It's time I think it's time it. to bust out the megaphone, get out on the street and just start yelling at people. That's a great idea. That's a really good idea. <laughs> we should try that today. We should, we should try that today. Um, uh. I, I think I still see this from time to time, but I want to see it more. And that is, Mike, next to the megaphone guy on the street is the sign flipper. We got to oh, yeah. get we more sign flipping. Get more sign flippers back out. Yep. Let's just see them every once in a while. Yeah, it's an yeah. easy way to build your brand. Yep. All right, that's six. We got four more. Uh, unfortunately, this one still happens, which is you tape the or, or, or rubber band the flyer to a rock mm. and you chuck it at people's houses. <laughs> Yeah. They'll still show up on my doorstep. I'm like, what are we doing? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Sometimes they make it inside your house. Hopefully not through your window. 
Mm, uh, yeah. That's a really, that's a great idea. I'm going to go uh, in a, same, a similar vein, uh, the, the paper airplane throw. Oh, I like Just that. Just kind of like chuck it and see who finds it, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, ice sculptures. We need more ice sculptures in our lives. And I think this is the time. Yeah. Yep. Mike, I'm just kind of piggybacking off of you because that really uh, in my head just made me think of the uh, the, bu- the the bush trimmers that make bushes into really creative <laughs> shapes. Uh, that's always fun. And always uh-huh. just a really good way to kind of etch something into your brain. So, yeah. What, what are we at? That's 10. That, that was 10. That was it. I, yeah. I got one more. I got 11. Okay. Bonus. All right. Bonus round. Uh, the Mount Rushmore effect. I, I think every brand should have their own mountain. You know, carve that logo right in. It's really and good uh, I, I think that would, that, that, we got to bring that back. You know, work for Teddy, to work for Teddy Roosevelt. Why not, why not make it work for you? So if you're out, if you're out there and you're listening to this and you own a plot of land with a mountain on it, just hold on to that because those are going to go way up in value. Yep. Corporations yep. are going to be coming hunting. For you're those. welcome. Yeah. You're, you're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. I, I only charge 1%. Yep. Oh, what I'll is take the that. Deal? So generous. It's a steel. It's a total steel. Uh, every logo mountain ever made from today forward, I get 1%. 1%. Goes to Mike Jones. Well done, Mike. <laughs> well, those are some uh, very, very those... interesting ideas. Find your frequency. Yeah. Well, maybe we should talk about some real interesting ideas yeah so i think we should talk about kind of some process we talked about a lot of like kind of tactics and strategy but we didn't really talk about a process last time and i think that's what i want to start out with today so uh, i was thinking about this i think everything for me always comes back to the first step in making things interesting is to write it down right we start with content first Um, we get ideas out in words some of that's just that it's easier, it's more efficient. Uh, you can write words way faster than you can draw things for most people. Uh, most people are not artistic either. So it's like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not comfortable drawing things. If you're more comfortable d- drawing, I, I guess you could start there. But even when I think about, you know, my career as a, as a graphic designer and, you know, back when I was doing a lot of logo designs and stuff, I'd always start with words first. I felt like I was able to like chase down a lot of ideas and kind of see how far I could take them before I would start implementing them in visuals. And I I just found that to be a much more efficient process. So I do recommend that everyone starts with writing things first, but not just writing anything, writing it right. And what I mean by that is having the right concepts first. And sometimes that takes some time, right? You got to like write it out a few times, maybe try some different ideas. If you need to do like a mind map, Uh, idea, you know, start with an idea in the middle. There's maybe some word or phrase that kind of is a central idea. And then let's see where we can go with that. What are related avenues we can take, see what branches off from that main idea uh, and see how far we can take it. But we're always looking for like, okay, no matter how far we take all these ideas and making it interesting, we want to make sure that they're actually still telling that story. So the storytelling process we talked about last time is really critical. Uh, Because if we don't know what we're saying, if we don't really know what's actually true about our brand, about our products and services, about the people that we're trying to talk to, then we can't actually have a meaningful conversation that is both interesting and right. Uh, And the first thing that makes things interesting is that they're true, right? We want we want true stories. We want true aspects of our brands. People want to interact with marketing that's actually telling the truth. Nobody wants lying marketing. Um, We might. I think be tempted. I think that's, I I see this a lot. We're tempted into thinking, oh, interesting means I need to push the envelope of what's true. And I think that's actually a very uh, faulty and short-sighted way to think about how to make your marketing more interesting. Don't stretch the truth. Uh, The goal is actually just make your truth more true by saying it more clearly uh, in an impactful and creative way. Uh, not by stretching it or making it untrue. Yeah. And I I think another element too is who is it interesting to? Like Mm -hmm. who is the interested party? Because you could take some internal ideas at your firm or your company, things that you all understand inside of your firm, 
and no one else is going to understand those. And you might think it's, you know, maybe there's an inside joke. Maybe there's something that a term that you use all the time that means something to your team, but then you throw it out into the, into the world and your marketing. It's, it's just falls flat because nobody understands it. So you really mm -hmm. need to think about your, your audience. Like what's interesting to my audience. Hey, if it's tax returns and let's figure out a creative way to talk about tax returns to the right people, that might not be interesting to the 15 year old sitting at home looking for a YouTube video, but it might be super interesting to the CFO at a restaurant group who's like yep. looking for that specific thing. So you, you have to for, forget about like, okay, what's, what's hip, what's, What's, what's everybody talking about it there? No, you got to think about what is my audience looking for? And once yep. you figure that out, you've got your own unique way of talking about it. And then that's where you start to kind of build these layers of like interest. What you said, Mike, about like, make sure you keep the foundation of truth, but then you can start to like kind of stretch the envelope a little bit about how you talk about it, the media you use to talk about it, where you're finding that audience. Yeah. And even the inspiration for like, OK, well, how do I take this true statement or these true facts, these true answers to people's questions and how do I make them interesting in a way that grabs their attention? I think that even goes back to what you just said of like, if I really understand who I'm talking to, if I am like so absolutely clear, like I can get in their head. Right. Um, let's say you're talking to like restaurant owners who a lot of them tend to be chefs, right? Or from a chef background. So if you include like food imagery and maybe some jokes that have to do with food or with cooking or just the experience of running a restaurant, like all of the ins and outs of dealing with customers and dealing with staff. Um, like imagine if you actually had that experience or you had people on your team that have restaurant experience, or you just go talk to a lot of people in the restaurant industry and try to like really grab every last little nuance that's interesting about the context that that, that kind of target prospect lives in, breathes every day. Yeah, um, That's gonna make your content super, super interesting. Because yep. um, you're going to be speaking to their world and their context and what they find, you know, really yeah. interesting. You think about even just like, you know, big name TV shows that people love, right? You think about like, go back, people love The Office, right? Well, one of the reasons why The Office worked is because they found things that were funny, obviously, like there's comedic writers and there's comedic actors who are acting this out and they're doing it really well, right? And that's part of being interesting is doing what you do really well and talking about it really well. But part of what made The Office really interesting was that it touched on experiences that a lot of people have, right? The ideas like of working in an office, working for a boss, working with coworkers, um, a lot of the storylines had very little to do with the actual work happening in the office and more about all the relationships in the office and even relationships between coworkers outside of the office. Uh, and the conversations that they have. And those are all very relatable to people. So if you're honed in on a specific industry or maybe you have a few different verticals, one thing that's gonna make your content and your marketing really, really interesting is if you can get really relatable to those people mm -hmm. and the context that they find themselves in. Um, even thinking all the way down to like, you know, for every, every single prospect that you have within your firm, um, think about the goals that they have the objectives and the values that they're trying to live out within their job, uh, whether that's owning the business or working within the business and reporting up to people. A lot of times what you find is that they actually have more than one need, uh, or more than one layer or level of need. Um, we were just talking about this with a client <laughs> just like an hour ago um, of like, there's these organizational needs, right? And I think that's what a lot of business marketers kind of like when we're talking B2B, we really understand the organizational needs. We understand, okay, their organization needs us to do this because it's going to deliver X for their business. Usually something like growth. Uh, <laughs> but then also think about like, what are the personal needs that each of my contacts at that organization or each of the roles within that organization that I'm, I'm going to be working with, what do they need? Uh, sometimes they don't just need the organizational uh, problems fixed. What they also need is like, Hey, like I, I report up to the 
the president of the company. Like maybe you have one of your key contacts there reports to the president of the company and looking good in front of the president, looking like an expert, looking like someone who really understands the business, understands the problems that that president is encountering, understands how to solve them in ways that really like hits the the objectives that the president has laid out in their vision, that's going to make them look great, right? And that's one of their personal goals. So understanding like personal as well as organizational uh, context is going to be really, really important for making your content interesting. It's yeah. so funny how like, you know, I'm thinking back, we've already done an episode like months ago about really understanding your audience. And we keep coming back to that. We keep coming back to like great storytelling principles throughout all these episodes. Um, it it is, keeps hitting me like how all encompassing and kind of uh, interwoven marketing is. You mm -hmm. can't just break it out. We're trying to break it out into these like very discrete, distinct sections. And yet we still come back to same principles that we've already talked about in episodes past. So um, just a good like reminder for everybody of like, don't leave the fundamentals. Uh, you never really graduate from everything. You just got to keep coming back to the same principles and, and keep working them into your marketing. All right, what's next in the process, Sam? So I think uh, a big part of this is just, like you said, Mike, kind of learning how to talk about yourself and your, your brand. Sometimes um, you do kind of need an outside perspective. Now, sometimes that can be uh, done through surveys. So you can kind of ask your clients, you can ask your, your team members, you can ask your parents, whatever, uh, about like, hey, how do you view us? This is what we think, but is this true? Like, is that what you actually think about? Um, and then, you know, because there's a lot of times where, like I just mentioned, you talk about things internally and everyone thinks they're on the same page and then you take that out into the world and nobody knows what you're talking about. So it is helpful to kind of bring in those outside perspectives. Um, and when we're talking about making your your marketing interesting, Mike, you and I kind of have a similar background where we have kind of that design background. Um, it is in any form of marketing, whether that's design, photography, video stuff, podcasting, it is always so much easier. And the end product is so much better when you have it written down, when you have mm -hmm. the, the written form of that, whatever it is. And sometimes it is just a blog post or sometimes it is a video script or whatever. But when you have that baseline of the content defined, well-defined, the end result of the creative, the, the end result of the marketing itself will be stronger because you've got that foundation. So I, I've been, you know, we've probably both been in both scenarios, right? Where it's like, hey, we want this ad. We need this ad because we want to sell this product. Okay. You got any other information? No, you guys are the experts. Just go do it. We just want it to work. <laughs> what? Okay. That's not going to work. Uh, and then it's like, hey, we've got this specific niche. We want to really spin up our, you know, our government agency accounting. Um, and we've got, this is why we're unique and this is why we're different. And that is like, okay, we've got something to work with here. Like, this is going to be great. Like, we know exactly what we're doing. So if you are, you know, in, in a marketing position and you've had some pain points around like, I just can't find a good graphic designer, uh, maybe look internally a little bit. Like, are you defining what you're trying to do well enough to set mm -hmm. up those different uh, parts of your marketing team for success? So that's yep. just a little tangent on like, how do we get there? How do we get to um, the kind of that end result that everybody wants of like, hey, people are talking about that latest ad that we did, or people are really yeah. loving the, the YouTube video we put out. Um, obviously, Mike, you can't do that without specific tools. I'll segue into kind of our tools section of yeah. what are the tools you use to build interesting marketing? And yeah, there's probably a million out there or maybe a mm -hmm. thousand. Um, <laughs> there are some specific ones that we have found to work really well in kind of the collaborative space. Um, I'll throw out a couple. Canva yeah. has Canva has quickly grown as like the um, I'm, you know, I'm even starting to use it for some video content. 
That's um, crazy. When you think about like two or three years ago, Canva kind of emerged and I was just like, this is lame. Like it's kind of like designing in PowerPoint a little bit. It's clunky. And now it's like, man, if we're designing social media posts or if we're doing like a series of, you know, quick social videos, Canva is just so easy, especially when it's like, oh, we've got the client who's already using Canva. We can go yep. back and forth. We can send that over. They're jumping in. it. It's this collaborative thing now that's just, they've almost made it too easy not to use it. <laughs> and it is easy to use, uh, which is great because we're finding more and more, Mike, where like we're a, we're a creative agency, we're a branding agency, but our clients want to own a lot of this content. Mm -hmm. They want to own a lot of the content that maybe they're hiring us to come in and, and start or help create, but then they want to, they want to run with it. And absolutely they should do that uh, because it's easier than ever to go create a, a minute long video. It's easier than ever to go design a good looking social media post or a video thumbnail or whatever it is. Um, so a lot of the tools that we're start, starting to gravitate towards are these collaborative tools like Canva, um, even, you know, Adobe is starting uh, and they have been for years now starting to integrate a lot of that collaborative functionality mm -hmm. into what they're doing, um, in their space. What are some of your favorite tools, Mike? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I mean, AI is definitely growing on me. <laughs> We're using it more and more, uh, particularly, uh, chat GPT. And then I've been using uh, Claude quite a bit. Anthropic's uh, content generation kind of AI engine, uh, particularly on the content side. That, I think that's where you're going to probably see the most opportunity there. I know you've been using a lot for imagery. I've, I'll be yeah. honest, I am still learning how to get it to do what I want on the imagery yeah. side. It's still a little hit and miss for me, but um, you've been able to get some really great results of like how fast you can generate images Yeah, that would have taken like, like, I mean, I've done a few where I'm like, man, that would have taken me like, 30, 40, maybe even 60 minutes to go hunt down a stock yeah. image. Yeah. And I can like plug in a couple prompts, maybe run it through like a couple different like rounds of revisions. Yep. And within 15 minutes, I've got really good image for what, I, what I've got kind of in my head. Yeah. Um, there's definitely some downsides like yeah. the, the fingers aspect, the hands thing. It's just, I don't know if that's on purpose now. I feel like maybe that is. Yeah. Uh, it's just like, this is garbage. Uh, but I mean, that's a big one. Um, even when it comes to like, if you're just sourcing images, Unsplash is just still my go-to. Yeah. I love yeah. using Unsplash. Uh, there's plenty of other pre like more, you know, premium uh, mm -hmm. stock imagery sites. If you're looking for stock vectors, stock icons, uh, yep. all sorts of great resources out there. Um I think uh, I was also thinking about um, just how much like we use Figma. I was realizing like oh. that's a that's a growing that's a tool in our toolbox. Um, yep. Everything from like Chris on our team uses it for like sketching out notes. Yep. It does a lot of visual note taking. Uh, we've done it for mind mapping. Uh, we've used it for like even running workshops with like kind of post-it note idea generation, brainstorming exercises. Yeah, uh, it's a fantastic tool. I really recommend that people check that out. Yep. Um, We've started, that's kind of augmented our, you know, Adobe suite a little bit because we're using mm -hmm. that now for web design. We're using it for even some print design. We're using it for digital design. Like it, there are certain brands we work with to where we've built out so much in Figma. We just have everything in there and it's so easy to kind of just copy and paste different elements across different boards, different applications in there. Figma is great. Yep. And it's got that great collaborative element, too, because I can send it to the client. We can look at it together. They can be in there. I can send it to other designers. They can jump in and everything's already in there. And they've just made it really easy to do that. That's a good that's a good one, Mike. I, I've I have grown. Figma has really grown on me in the last year. Again, it was like, oh, I, I just love the Adobe suite. I know how it works. <laughs> and then Figma is just like, I can copy and paste from this program into Figma directly. OK. All right, Figma's, this is good. I like this. Yep. Uh, I think there's like a lot of tools out there that I don't think I always realize are like creative tools. One of those is just like I use Google Drive and on the Google Docs, uh, PowerPoint, or their version of PowerPoint. You know, and I, I don't know that like 
it's necessarily better than Microsoft using that. Um, it's just what I've gravitated towards. I love the collaborative features of those tools, though. And I think that's one thing I think Google does do a little bit better than Microsoft within their like workspace tools is a collaboration aspect. It's really easy to share and work. I mean, I've, I remember even working on like live docs with uh, back in the, the partnership days of the business before you were a partner, Sam, like David, Jeff and I, we'd be like working on like strategic documents for Resound, like our own marketing, our own st strategy, our own marketing plans. And we'd all three be working in a shared Google Doc at the same time um, and using almost as like this, this brainstorming, mm -hmm. recording, uh, ideation tool. Um, Figma might be a little bit better for that kind of process, but I still come back and use uh, Google Drive a lot. And then um, I've been using, funny enough, I use Apple Notes all the time to just yeah. keep track of little notes and stuff. And one of the things I really like about it is that I've, I've got an iPad with the pencil, like the drawing tool on my iPad. And you can, you can do um, handwritten or drawn, you know, if you're doing visual note taking, that kind of thing in Apple Notes. And it syncs with all my devices so I can go find that yeah. note anytime. I can also type in notes in that same note. So I can go back and forth if I want to do that. Have some that's like handwritten or visual, like sketch out some ideas. Um, I found that to be a really, really good tool for ideation and for just taking lots of notes, coming up with ideas, maybe yeah. like sketching out a, a few like visuals to go with it all at the same time. So helps you sleep. That's too, a favorite right? one. I've used that. I've used the notes app late at night when I'm like trying to go to sleep and I've got something running through my head. I'm like, I know I'm going to forget this. Okay. Uh -huh. Just let me plug it in here real quick. I know I've got it somewhere. And then, you know, the next day or the next week I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to go find that again. Yep. Um, there are, yep. there are a lot of multimedia tools too. Like we, we, we love video. Um, mm -hmm. Video is becoming increasingly easier to create. Um, there's a lot of tools now on your smartphone that, uh, that didn't exist 10 years ago that just like, I, you know, I have a rich history in video. And when I have the time and the desire, I'll, you know, throw it onto my laptop or my iMac and really like pour into it. But sometimes like, and I, I do this a lot in my personal life with my family, like I, soccer highlights for my kids. Like I've got some good clips from their game and I'm like, I don't want to sit down for an hour. Like I'm going to just throw this into iMovie on my iPhone, stitch it together in two minutes, upload it to YouTube and share it with the grandparents, you know, like just little things like that where it's like, do you need to spend an hour on it or do you need to spend two minutes on it? <laughs> and there's a lot of tools out there too, like outside of video to where I've had to constantly remind myself like, okay, I'm trying to build this thing from scratch. Or I'm trying to build this graphic from scratch. I bet somebody's already done this that I can go, you know, purchase it for three dollars or whatever, and just yep. tweak it, change the colors, whatever. That's where like a lot of subscription tools come in handy. Like you can subscribe to um, image and graphic design galleries of like, you know, we use FreePick.com. It's free p i k dot com. Um, yeah. They've got millions of stock photos vector files that you can download on demand um i think they they're starting to do like video clips and audio stuff and like it's like 20 bucks a month and i use that almost every day like if i need an element if i need an icon i'm not gonna go spend 45 minutes developing my own smiley face icon i can go get that in 30 seconds on a <laughs> website like that so just little tools like that that you kind of find that fit into your workflow, that make your life easier, that enhance what you're creating too, because you're able to do more with what, you know, the time and the constraints you have. So we've, we've got uh, several different tools like that with that are go to for us for sure. Yep. I, this is not on my list here. Uh, I'm going to jump off script a little bit, but this isn't necessarily a tool, but just a maybe a little sidebar to talk to a lot of professionals in their firms, right? You know, you've got accountants, you got lawyers, you got engineers, uh, even like beyond that, like if you're working in manufacturing or somewhere else, all, all the people actually doing the work, not always necessarily thinking that their work is very creative. And I think sometimes forgetting like the, the, the space that's needed in order to be creative. 
And I was talking with uh, a marketer in an accounting firm recently, I actually just put out an article that talked about this with them over at uh, Capstan, uh, but uh, from their accounting firm, but just giving creatives time and space to be creative. So like there's so much demand on marketers and their creative teams to just execute and pump out tons and tons of content. And I love all these processes and tools that are gonna make that more efficient and get you to get more content and get more ideas out. I'm all for that. At the same time, I think it's really important that you allow your creatives, especially the creatives, to have time and space to work on things that are maybe a little bit off of the day to day. So whether that's creating like an opportunity for them to work on something that's a tool that they don't normally get to work with, right? So maybe it's like, hey, I, I love motion graphics, but we just don't really use that a lot in our marketing. Uh, maybe find a project to allow them to, to exercise that kind of application of creativity. Or it might be like, hey, let's run a little pro bono project for a nonprofit that we love. And let's give them you know, a set amount of time from our marketing team to help them with a campaign or something that they're working on and allow your creatives to kind of flex and exercise their muscles in a different way when it comes to their creativity. Um, and then the other part of it is just like giving them enough time to work on the things that really are, need to be maybe more interesting. So like, you know, are you going to give people a lot of time to work on the next social post? No, like that's just, that's not worth it, right? The value isn't there but you have a big campaign, campaign coming out, or maybe you're gonna go do a new vertical launch, or you know, you're actually maybe you're gonna rebrand <laughs> uh, or do a refresh to your branding, making sure you build in enough time for the creative process in that and allowing people to like chase a lot of different ideas and kind of see where they go. Um, I think there's a general rule of thumb in like logo design uh, that you for every final logo, right? So like, Here's the logo that got launched that went with the brand and everybody gets to see it and everyone loves it and it looks great. How many different logos did it take to get to that one? And a lot of times if you're working with an agency, you're not going to see all the options that they've come up with. In fact, I would argue you shouldn't. Uh, you'll probably get, you know, kind of logo overload and you'll have decision paralysis <laughs> if you're the client. But on the creative side, like, when you think about how many different sketched options and ideas got sketched out all the way through to like final, like actual, like worked them out in Adobe Illustrator and some kind of design tool and brought them all the way to like color, you know, a color version. And it's like really finely polished, right? If you think that entire process from rough sketches all the way through, my guess is at least, at the very least over a hundred ideas, right? At least if you're working with a good team, yeah. <laughs> whether that's in-house or you know externally with an agency or consultancy, um, but a hundred ideas, right? And and that's that's what it takes to come up with really good ideas is to allow creatives the opportunity to chase down as many different paths as possible that are still right, right? Going back to that principle that we talked about at the beginning here, but really just making sure that you're giving them time. Um, and so I would put that in your tool set, time. Time is one of the biggest tools. Now, you don't wanna give them endless amounts of time, just like you know, endless amounts of paper for a writer is never a good idea. Constraints are helpful. Give them a budget, give them a time constraint, give them deadlines, absolutely. Um, but making sure that there is enough time built in for them to try some different ideas. And, and be willing to, to sit through a lot of ideas, right? Um, you know, good experienced creatives will get to good ideas faster. They will. Uh, so if you're working with people who are less experienced, give them more time, <laughs> um, and maybe pair them up with some people who are more experienced <laughs> to help them refine their ideas uh, a little bit faster, but also like, just know that even the best designer, the best writer, it, it takes iterations to get to something really, really interesting and really creative. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to be the first option uh, necessarily. Sometimes it is. Um, but even in that, like coming to realize that that's the best option, that that first one was, requires you to go through a few different iterations. Yeah. So uh, that would just be my little sidebar, side tangent. Yeah, that's uh, great. Really encourage people to like make sure you're building in enough time and enough space yep. for the creative process to really work. Yep.
And I think there is a, you know, for, for people outside of the creative world, there, there sometimes is a uh, temptation to say, we want this to be good, but we don't want you to spend any time on it. And so don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that to your creative team. Um, we, we, we want, so we want something produced well. It's, you know, it, it might be like uh, a little bit like we want our tax return to be accurate, but can you just spend half the time you did last year on it? Um, <laughs> that's not going to work. That's just not going to work. Uh, Mike, well, even you do. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to over overstate this or beat it up too long. But even if you think about like in the accounting profession, right? If you're an accountant and let's say beyond the tax return, right? Beyond just like filling in the numbers, you're helping your clients solve real problems in their business or in their you know, personal finances or something like that. If you don't have time to dig in and really understand what's going on in their business, let's say you're working with a business, yeah. really understand their financials and even research what other businesses like theirs are doing. Maybe see like who's kind of on the leading edge of, you know, taking advantage of different uh, regulatory options that are out there, uh, different like financial like models. Like if you're not researching and you're not listening to your client and you're not spending time digging in and analyzing their particular financials, you're probably not going to have really sophisticated, really good solutions for them. You might be able to come up with some best practices that you know from every other client you've worked with, but you're not going to know like their specific context and really come up with like the best solution. That's very much similar to the creative process, right? Um, if you don't allow for that time to do the research, to come up with ideas, iterate, talk to others, get feedback, um, it's just not going to be as good. So, yeah. yeah. So, Mike, what do you do when you're sitting in a meeting with maybe a partner or two or three at your firm and they said, hey, did you see what firm X, Y and Z did? <laughs> we got to do that. That's cool. And you're sitting there and you're like, that is totally not us. How do you make sure that your marketing, while you want it to be interesting, stays on brand? Yeah. No, that's a fantastic question. Because I am sure that that scenario never happens. Probably never ever. happens. Never. never. Yeah. If ever, maybe like once every three years. But um, in the off chance that it does in the future, what do you do? Yeah. So first of all, we've talked about this already, past episodes, you have to have a brand and you need to define your brand, right? What do you stand for? What are your values? What's your personality? What are the traits of your personality? What's your story? What, what are you trying to do, right? Uh, what problems do you help people solve? How do you solve them? What does that impact have on them? Um, beyond that, like even like vision and mission, where are you headed? What's the trajectory you're on? What's the strategy by which you're gonna get there? What's your three-year plan? Those things have to be in place and they have to be documented in a way that everyone knows what they are yeah. and can refer to them so that when someone does that and they go, oh, shiny object syndrome, look at that thing over there, right? You can go, hang on a sec. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. This is what we're doing. This is the plan. It doesn't mean that you can't acknowledge their idea and even say maybe there's a place for it but we don't blow everything up just because one shiny object shows up over on the horizon over there right and so i think that's the first step is you must document and you must well you have to define your brand and you have to define the attributes of your brand and then you have to document them in such a way that everyone goes oh yeah we, we see that all the time so things like having a handbook making sure that everybody actually has a copy, making sure everybody has actually been guided through it. Not just like, oh, here's the copy. I It sits on my desk, but I have no idea how to use it, right? I've never really looked at it, or maybe I looked at it once when it was handed to me, or it was emailed to me, it's this digital thing, and I, I don't know what it is. I don't know, even know what's in there, right? Have they, has it been, have they been walked through it? How, do you come back and revisit those things to reinstill them? I think, you know, your values is a big one. Talk about your values all the time. Talk about your story all the time. Come back and go, hey, how are we doing on these things? 
are we staying on point? That's going to alleviate a lot of these issues of like, hey, so-and-so is doing this over here. We should probably be doing that. Um, now, tactically, that's where the things get a little bit harder when the next person that jumps up and says, whoa, uh, competitor A Y, you know, ABC over there is using TikTok. We should probably have a TikTok channel too. Or my latest favorite is WhatsApp. Accounting firms need to be using WhatsApp? I mean, maybe. But again, like this is where I go, why would your firm need to use WhatsApp? I wouldn't necessarily like, yeah, be paying attention to what your competitors are doing. Maybe they're doing something that you don't, you, you shouldn't miss out on, right? That's a valid thing to be doing. But every single thing you see them doing that you're not doing, you should then run back through and go, is this us? So one, does it fit our brand, who we are? And number two, uh, is it our clients, right? So just because your competitor is using a particular tool or a certain tactic in their marketing, that may be because they're talking to people different than your people, the people you want to be in front of. So like consider that. Um, just because everyone else is doing it or just because one other player is doing it does not mean you should be doing it. Is it something you can consider? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Write it down. Think about it. Have a conversation. But those are the questions I'd be asking. Is this us? Is this the people that we're really trying to reach? Do they care about this? Um, and then if so, if the answer is yes to those things, then the question I would then have is how can we address this? Whether that's a particular channel that we need to be on or it's a particular topic we need to be talking about that's new, right? So AI is a big one. Everybody apparently wants to be talking about AI now. Does not matter what profession you're in. I, I can't wait for McDonald's to have an AI commercial. They're going to have one. They were going to talk about AI. And I'm like, what does that have to do with your food? I have no idea. No idea. Right. Um, everyone wants to talk about, it. okay, let's say you decide this is us. We do need to talk about it. And yes, our clients care about this. So we need to talk about it. Then the next question I would say is how can we talk about it in a way that reveals that we have a unique point of view on it? Right. That this actually matters to us at a deep fundamental level, and we see how it matters to our clients. If you can't answer those questions, don't talk about it. Yeah. Don't just stick keywords in just to stick keywords in. Yep. Um, one, that's not interesting. It's confusing. It's really confusing. And number two, it doesn't actually differentiate you, right? You actually look like somebody who's just a sheep following all the other sheep. Yep. <laughs> that's what it looks like. Yep. And it just screams desperation. Uh, in my opinion, that that part might be my opinion, but the rest of it, I'll I'll uh, back up as less than opinion. Yeah, more yeah, like you, fundamental. When you're when you're crafting uh, messaging, crafting creative, um, especially if you haven't done this in the past, early on, keep those guidelines close by. Like print them out. Maybe you've got them in a a, a book, or maybe just print them out on on paper and staple them together. I've found that really helpful when we're either starting a new engagement or we've done a rebrand or whatever that is. But like having, you know, we we create brand handbooks and having that you can flip through the pages. OK, what, what did they say about this element of their brand? What can we not do when we talk about this or when we're using this specific platform? What do we do over here? And hopefully that's well defined so that you're not having to make those guesses during that creative process, you've already got it documented. And then Mike, you touched on it, but making sure, and, and hopefully this is coming from the top down in your firm, but making sure that those, those brand guidelines are not a surprise to anyone inside your firm. Hopefully those are being talked about in, you know, all team yeah. meetings, you're, you're touching on them. And that, that could need to be you as the marketer in some instances like hey we're going to do a little presentation on this or i'm going to go to one of the partners and talk through an idea i'm going to bring up these guidelines that we have in our brand handbook so keeping those top of mind so that when you do have to kind of reference back to them when there is a request that kind of goes outside of who you are as a brand you can be like hey do you remember that do you remember what we put in our brand guidelines that doesn't fit and it's not like, what, what, do you, what are those? I've never seen those before. Like, hopefully those are like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, we're, we're, we shouldn't do that. 
Um, so hopefully those are top of mind. Hopefully those are not a surprise to anyone inside of your firm. Um, those should be used frequently, um, not only in the marketing, but really throughout the organization. Um, yep. There's another element here, Mike, that uh, can kind of fit into staying on brand. And that's just, that's consistency. Hmm. Being consistent in your marketing, not changing up, you know, the, the uh, campaign or the feel or the look or the creative every month, like being consistent. And I, I've heard you say this a bunch, Mike, if you're getting tired or bored of your brand and your marketing, you're doing it the right way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I do say that all the time. <laughs> but it's true. Like you are the one, if you're creating, if you're the marketer, you're probably going to think at times like, this is, is it, are people getting tired of this? Are people getting tired of hearing this? Are people getting tired of seeing that? That color we use all over the place. Should we find a new color? Like you're going to be tempted to do that if you're using your brand in the right ways. Because yep. you're the person who's going to see that the most. You're probably going to see that more than anyone else at your firm if you're the marketer. But yep. don't forget that consistency is really important when it comes to brand. Think about the commercials you see on TV or the radio spots. If you listen to a certain radio station and you're like, really? Again? It's like the 30th time I've heard that commercial <laughs> about Windows. Like, really, guys? Like, I'm so tired of this. But hey, when you need new Windows, boom. The window company is top of mind because you've heard about them 30 different times. Yep. So consistency is still really important when you're thinking about creating content. Um, consistency is important when you're thinking about um, how to make it interesting and not just like, oh, yeah, we post every day or, oh, yeah, we're posting social media posts like twice every day. We're talking more about just the consistency from a brand standpoint. Are yep. you keeping things consistent with who you are as a brand? I, there's a great kind of real world example of this happening right now. So State Farm has had this character in their ads, Jake. I think most people are familiar with him. Um, it, and they've done a fantastic job with the ads, right? Uh, over the, And been several years of using this, this character. Yeah. Uh, always played by the same actor uh, over and over, right? So there's a lot of consistency there. He's always wearing a State Farm shirt in every ad, right? And obviously the rest of the ads is very consistent. The logo shows up, um, the messaging, all that fun stuff. What's been really interesting, uh, I was just reading an article, I think yesterday or the day before, that State Farm is now having that actor go out to real events. Yeah. So like putting them at basketball games, putting yeah. them at like sporting events, putting them at concerts, and sometimes not even like in a performance type uh, aspect, but just like, hey, we're going to go buy him a seat at the basketball game on the floor. So, you know, very visible, right? It's yeah. strategic. And he's just going to show up like a regular human being. And he's got, uh, you know, multiple social media channels that are his. And he doesn't hawk State Farm. He talks about like normal everyday things and has normal everyday interactions with people and celebrities. And he's just, he's like a person. He's like an embodiment of this guy, Jake, who just happens to always wear a stage farm shirt. Like he's just always yeah. on brand with the shirt. Um, but I was I was like, the only reason that works, and this was interesting, in the article they were trying to claim of like, this is more effective than advertising, right? That like the ads are not as effective as this like real world character. And I'm like, that's sort of true, right? Because people will relate to this guy, Jake Moore, at this level of like a real human being that shows up at random events and has like his own social media channels as Jake, the state farm guy. Yep. But the only reason that he can exist like that as a character in real life is because they ran ads with him over and over yep. and over and over and over until people were just like, Jake state farm, state farm, Jake, this guy who plays Jake is the Jake state farm guy. And so when he shows up in real life in public and has these social media channels putting out content, little videos and stuff, it's all like it works because they've created the character already yeah. through the ads. Yep. And that kind of like reinforced for me of like these baseline elements, your brand elements, your tagline, your logo, 
your colors are kind of like Jake from State Farm. And you can take that further. You could create your own character if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and we did talk about that, I think, last time around, like mascots for B2B brands. They do exist. Uh, you maybe need to think about them a little bit differently than you're thinking like Michelin Man type guy. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, no one needs to look like a marshmallow. Um, but but you can – those elements of your brand, the reason they have life down the road is only because you've been really consistent with them over and over and over and over and over and over again, right? And so, like, they bring on, they, they carry more meaning the more you use them consistently. If you think about Nike, Nike's a great example of this. That swoosh stands on its own now. You put that on anything, almost anywhere in the world, and people know exactly what it is. They're like, that's Nike. They don't have to use their name. They just have to use the swoosh, right? But that's only because they've been so consistent at using that swoosh Early on with their name, the original logo was Nike, the name with the swoosh underneath, and they used it all the time that way. And then they used the swoosh very consistently on every product, specifically the shoes, right? That swoosh was on the side of every shoe. And I'm sure somewhere in there, someone along the line, some designer in their in their company who was working on the shoe designs was like, do I have to put a giant swoosh on the side? We've done this for so long. Can't we just like move it somewhere? Can't we make it smaller? Can't I like put it just on the bottom of the shoe? Won't it be cool? And the answer is no, because it has to be consistent in order to build that meaning. Now they can put it anywhere, right? On anything. And it means Nike, right? Okay. And it's their stamp of approval on everything that they do. So um, just to reinforce that consistency is really, really important in this process. Yeah. So yeah. part of what makes things interesting is, is like the fun side of it, right? Like being crazy and coming up with something off the wall or combining ideas that you wouldn't naturally put together. That is part of creativity. That's part of making things interesting. The other part of being interesting is being true consistently. Yep. Right. And just using these creative tools, make them interesting over and over and over and over and over again. Um, there's a time and place to like, mix things up a little bit um you know like hey make sure your color palette has enough colors in it that you're not like beating your head against the wall in six months because you only put purple and black in yeah. the color palette and it's like oh we are just dying over here because we can't our our, our limitations are so great we have so many constraints on our brand that it's just like really constricting be yeah. careful of that right or know what you're doing when you say it wore purple and black and that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, now there's power in that. There's a lot of power in being really, really specific uh, in your visual elements. So, but it yeah. just, no, does that fit us? Is that our culture? Are we willing to stick with something that is that, that duo tone color palette for a really long time? Uh, and then when you do add a color, there better be a really good reason that you're adding a color. It can't just be, Oh, we're bored. Um, it needs to be like, no, it stands for something. It means something. It's really yep. impactful to our business. Yep. Um, yeah, I think we've covered it all, Sam. This is like, uh, this is what I was hoping for, for this episode. I love it. Yeah. So many great ideas here. So many good processes, tools, uh, maybe a little bit of preaching in there too. <laughs> a little bit. It, it It is so fun though, when you figure it out, when it kind of clicks of like, this is who we're talking to. This is what we're going to say. And this is what it's going to look like when you kind of figure those things out and it clicks. It's like, oh, this is oh, yes, let's go. Let's let's go. I'm super excited as opposed yeah. to like, what are we doing? Like, we're supposed to be doing this. A partner yeah. wants this. Like, I, I don't believe it. Whatever. Like when you've kind of built your marketing the right way and each layer has been set in the correct place, it can get really, really fun. I'm going to go back to one final point, and it's something I've already made, but your constraints matter, and what constraints you put on the project are going to have an impact both negatively and or positively to your creativity, to the interest that you're going to develop. So one of the things I'm going to say again, build in enough time, and also related to that, build in enough budget, whether you're paying people in-house, you're bringing in outsiders to do help, help you with your creativity and, and putting out your content. If you don't pay, if, if you don't have enough budget in there 
if everyone is feeling this like really tight pinch all the time of like, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough budget, and the deadlines are creeping up and we gotta put out more content, I guarantee you nothing will be interesting. It will all default to lowest common denominator. It will be whatever AI generates without any edits from a human being is what you're gonna get. Um, and it will not be interesting. It will be what everyone else is already saying. Uh, it's what everyone else is already doing. It's gonna look cookie cutter. It's gonna look like everything else because when all of those constraints are put on and there's no freedom, right? Whether there's budget, there's no time freedom, there's no space in that project to be creative and chase new ideas, then everyone's gonna default to whatever is easiest. And whatever is easy is going to be cliche. It's gonna be lowest common denominator. It's gonna be you know generalized. It's gonna look, sound, and feel like everything else that's already out there. That is what's going to happen. And more likely than not, you're gonna find your team actually just going, hey, uh, that, that firm over there, just make it look like them, but use our colors. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> it will not differentiate you in the market. So uh, my last final little uh, mini sermon there. It's good. <laughs> preaching to the choir, Mike. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's the problem. We're preaching to the choir. But if you're listening in and you're a partner of a firm or maybe you oversee some creatives, please give them a little bit of freedom. Give them a little bit of, of runway. N not too much, though. Otherwise, they'll go crazy. Yeah, not too much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate you listening to another episode. We will be back next month. Uh, and I think we're going to be talking about how do we get all of our marketing to work? How do we even know if it's working? We're going to be talking about metrics. So I'm really excited for that. Oh, this stuff actually has to work, Mike? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> Just probably do something. <laughs> The Remarka Brand Podcast is a project of Resound and is recorded in Tempe, Arizona. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and at RemarkableCast.com. If you'd like more episodes, subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you prefer to get your podcasts. To contact the show, find out more about the Remarka Brand Podcast, or to join our newsletter list to make sure you never miss another episode, check out our website at remarkablecast.com. Copyright Resound Creative Media, LLC.